Um, but without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today. Um, we have Dr. Sabrina Piedemonte. Um, she is a second year fellow in gynae oncology at the University of Toronto. She recently completed a program in clinical effectiveness with a focus in predictive modeling, machine learning, and survival analysis. Her current research interest in includes improving precision medicine in, in advanced ovarian cancer with the development of a prediction model for cytoreductive outcomes and a photo documentation study, application of machine learning in gynae oncology, and prevention of cervical cancer with HPV vaccination and education. So thank you so much, Dr. Piedemonte. You're actually our first speaker from outside of BC. So we're very excited to have you and I'll um, pass you uh, the mic. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me um, this opportunity to present um, at the GCI rounds. I'm very humbled and honored to present my project and along with my supervisor, um, Dr. Danielle Vikas, um, I'm going to speak about machine learning in gynecologic oncology and enhancing the era of precision medicine. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. The learning objectives of today's talk will be to define artificial intelligence and machine learning, understand how machine learning is currently being used and introduced in medicine and particularly in gynecologic oncology, and an example of one of my studies which um, is incorporating machine learning in predicting recurrence in high-grade endometrial cancer, and this was a pan-Canadian national collaborative. The outline of our talk will be the background. So we'll focus on what is machine learning, um, machine applications of machine learning in medicine, machine learning in gynae oncology. So since this is a very new field, it is quite foreign to a lot of clinicians at the moment. And so I think it's going to be very important to um, speak about a little bit. It's going to be a little bit technical, but I think quite important to, for us to start introducing the background as this is going to be um, eventually the future of how we, we practice medicine, um, just has how we've integrated traditional statistics into our um, learning and to our, um, for example, our training and our fellowship. And then we'll go through the objectives, the methods and results of my current project, um, and then future and ongoing work. So when we get into medical school, um, everybody has a preconception of what a doctor does. So what my friends think I do, what my partner thinks I does, what society thinks I do is being like Grey's Anatomy, what my parents think I do, what I think I do, what I really do, but really, um, our patients think that we often are able to make predictions um, and that's the role of the doctor in the eyes of the patient. So we often get asked questions um, to be fortune tellers. So for example, um, for example, in obstetrics and gynecology where we train, what is my due date? Will I need a C-section? In, specifically in gynecologic oncology, we're always asked the question, do I have cancer, which a lot of times we don't know the answer of, and we're often asked to make predictions or make a preoperative diagnosis. Um, Another question we often get is, will we respond to treatment? What is the percentage of response to treatment? Um, will my cancer come back? Um, and ultimately, how long do I have to live? Um, so these are all questions that require a physician to make predi predictions based on a, a previously known statistic. And so the traditional ways of making predictions of medicine have re relied on um, traditional um, st statistical analysis. So for example, many scoring systems that we do know is the Bishop scoring system. Um, the APGAR scores that we used when we were in obstetrics and gynecology, for example, in internal medicine, there's the CHAD score. Um, here is the score that a predictive score that I developed in my master's. I, I'm very shy to say that that was over 10 years ago, um, but it was looking to predict benign or malignancies um, using CA125 and ultrasound. And the current predictive model that I developed with my supervisor, Dr. Hogan, and Dr. May and Dr. Bernardini at UHN, um, However, these are all limited uh, by the fact that they use stati uh, traditional statistics, most commonly logistic regression, um, and these are limited by data lim linearity assumptions. So, for example, when we talk about survival analysis, you always you can't do a Cox proportional hazards um, if you don't need the uh, proportionality assumption, um, and you can only use a small number of value variables based on the number of events. So, if you want to add many predictors into your model, you'll need to have a high number of events in order um, to have a, an accurate model. 
So this is where uh, machine learning comes in and we want to find a better way to make predictions. Um, and then there's always a little confusion about what artificial intelligence is and what machine learning is and what deep learning is. And they're really all sub branches of each other. So artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science that deals with simulation of human intelligence by machine processes and computational rationality. Machine learning is a, is a branch of artificial intelligence which uses algorithms with the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed. So for example, in traditional statistics, we tell the model what we want it to compute, whereas machine learning, um, it really uses inferences from the data that you put in to make accurate predictions. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning in which artificial neural networks adapt and learn from various amount of data, and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Another concept um, in artificial intelligence is the concept of supervised versus unsupervised learning. Um, and the difference is supervised learning, which is the traditional statistics, is where you have a teacher who tells the students and tells the class um, how to learn and what to learn. And so uh, when I took the, uh, my classes at Harvard last year during my research year, it was a bit of a joke now that we're living in the COVID pandemic and the Zoom era is that everybody would shut off their screens um, during the lecture. And that was unsupervised learning. Um, but really what unsupervised learning means is that um, how we humans learn and how we figure things out um, on our own without explicitly being taught. Um, and so that's why unsupervised, well, that's what unsupervised learning is. And the rationale is that why would we want to learn without a teacher or unsupervised is that we want to create intelligent systems that can succeed at a wide variety of tasks uh, without explicitly teaching them. And so to teach on one task and transfer to another task. So supervised learning defines a task to make a prediction on an outcome Y. For example, logistic regression, which we know well, um, the decision trees, ensemble methods, and bagging and boosting, which I'll talk about a little bit um, further. So for example, a decision tree is a build uh, classification trees based on predictive probabilities and splitting rules. It creates a, a set of binary predictors. So yes and no, death or alive, um, any binary outcome. And it identifies the best split for the binary outcome based on a two by two table. And it first, the first split is always on the strongest predictor of the outcome. And then you repeat it as much as you uh, you would like um, it to have a number of splits. So some, some very easy example is the sex male or female, yes or no, um, is the, and is, then they split it based on um, the age and then they split it on the, the systolic blood pressure and to predict their overall outcome, which is binary, um, dead or alive. Um, one example of my own research um, is where we can split. This is my predictive model on cider reduction um, in ovarian cancer. Um, and so you can see that our outcome was uh, cider reduction to optimal, so less than one centimeter. And I put in a variety of predictors um, and you can see, so the first one it split on was based on age. And then there were uh, really very different parameters and I could make as many trees as I want or as little trees um, as I wanted as well. And so the idea uh, beside, uh, in decision trees is that you can keep making an infinite amount of splits on your data, but then you, uh, you run the risk of overtraining your model. Um, and so more isn't all necessarily better. So what overtraining means is that in your training set that where you've developed your model, you might have a very good outcome, a very good performance, but then when you apply it to another data set, it's not going to perform very well. Um, and so to to address this, there's a concept of pruning, which is making less trees, or bagging and boosting, which I will briefly explain as these are quite um, technical terms. Um, so in an ensemble method, we combine multiple machine learning algorithms to make weak predictions and to combine them to make stronger predictions. Um, individual trees that have high variability and average the trees reduces the bias. And so that's the rationale. And then bootstrapping takes a repeated bootstrap uh, samples of the models, creates multiple models, and then generates a prediction rules on each sample to develop a random subsample using the original with bootstrap sampling method. And boosting is a method that can convert weak models into stronger ones. So a bootstrap random forest model is a common use machine learning algorithm as an ensemble method that makes 
infinite or k um, amount of bootstrap samples and you construct as many amounts of trees from these and the first node randomly selects the variables on which to split and it selects the best um, split from these variables and it's able to make an average estimate over the trees or use a majority um, vote and the advantages of this is that it's accurate the trees are independent you could find many splits for continuous variables it over the model or the function and you can include correlated predictors which is a good advantage a boosted trees is another type of algorithm and it builds on a series of smaller trees and it's using the basis of weighted majority so more accurate trees have more weight in your model and it uses a principle of residuals and the final model is a weighted sum of the individual trees and this is a concept called additive modeling and it, this avoids overfitting the residuals and it minimizes the loss functions. So these are all still in the supervised learning realm because you're telling the model, you're putting in predictors and you're telling the model to spit out the predictions of an outcome. Whereas in unsupervised learning, the task is not defined and so there's no Y value and you give one task and then allow a network to generalize on many other tasks. For example, cluster analysis and neural networks and it's commonly uh, referred to as the black box. And so in the goal of, of unsupervised learning is to put many, many parameters together, um, have them into a centralized nodes, make connections on the data in these centralized nodes and give out an output. So for example, a neural network is a series of algorithms that endeavors to recognize the underlying relationships in a set of data. And that goes through a central node to make predictions. And these are commonly used in studies where they use machine learning on imaging and uh, gathering pixels. Um, and so how do we apply machine learning in medicine? Um, so I've I had the honor um, to have a lecture with Dr. Eric Topol, which is a very famous um, a person, a pioneer in, in machine learning. And so I, I like this slide a lot because it really shows us that across the lifespan, we can really apply machine learning to make predictions. So from embryos being selected in IVF to medical assistance device, to um, predicting diagnosis and identification of disease, to predict predicting mortal mortality and also disease classification as well. So one um, nice example here, um, using a smartphone and using an app, they were able to develop a tool that was able to um, detect middle ear fluid. Another very popular topic um, in the last year and a half would be making predictions using machine learning for COVID. Um, and so this was one study um, that did a similar kind of analysis, which what I learned in my classes and I'm gonna apply to my research as well, is just test many different models to see which one is the best model um, to predict your outcome um, based on ROC curves and then finding what were the most predictive variables in this model. So what they did in this specific study is they took clinical and biochemical parameters and included 212 patients. The average age was 53 years old. Um, 74 patients required ICU admission and 47 required uh, mechanical vent ventilation. Um, and their outcome was to predict the need for mechanical ventilation. So they entered a, very, a lot of uh, clinical parameters and they found that their best model was a class of uh, forest, random forest model with an area under the curve of 0.88 to predict the ICU admission and 0.82 to prevent predict mechanical ventilation. And there's been many other studies um, in AI in the COVID era, which is either predicting mortality, predicting response to treatment, or predicting outbreaks. Machine learning in Gagnon is a new field that's been um, relatively uh, being slowly introduced into our, our practice. And there's been quite a few studies already um, being published and slowly being recognized and introduced into our field. Um, so I just have three uh, papers to just briefly give it as an example. So one of the papers was looking at prediction of survival outcomes in patients with epithelial ovarian cancer using machine learning methods. And what they did is that they developed a gradient boosted tree model to predict um, overall survival at two years. And this um, was the model performed um, with an AUC of 0.84. And this was much higher than the Cox proportional hazards model, which had an area under the curve of 0.59. They also found that their gradient boosted classification model um, on survival performed better um, than the fecal staging. So I thought this paper was quite interesting. 
Another example, and what we can see a lot in the literature is machine learning being used in the field of um, cervical cancer detection. Um, so not only for MRI detection, but also for, for pap tests um, and cytology. So that's an upcoming world as well. And so this is just one example uh, where they developed a complex neural network um, to predict cervical cancer on T2 weighted images and how their neural network performed much better than a radiologist interpretation alone. So finally, one more example, um, just not only in gynae oncology, but in general oncology, um, the, this um, was an algorithm to predict 180 day mortality um, in oncology population. And so this was within 18 centers. The median age of patients included was 65. And they found that their um, observed 180 day mortality was 45.2% and their area under the curve for predicting mortality was 0.89. Um, and what their conclusion was, was because their model performed so well, is that their next step would be to incorporate this um, prediction model into their EMR and would be allow, based on the patient's parameters, lab values from a certain day, um, to predict their mortality of that admission. So this leads us um, to our current topic, which is um, predicting recurrence in, in, in high-grade endometrial cancer. Um, and what is interesting about endometrial cancer is now over time, it has evolved into it not being a, considered a heterogeneous disease anymore. Um, and we've been um, over time developing ways to actually increase precision in endometrial cancer. Um, so one of the ways would be by um, molecular by uh, molecular um, ge genetics and with using the, the PROMISE trial in the TCGA to really classify endometrial cancer much more precisely than just by fecal stage and the common GOG and PORTEC criteria. Another way we've in increased precision in endometrial cancer is using sentinel lymph node mapping as compared to um, complete lymphadenectomy. Again, we have, we've had the PORTEC molecular analysis as well. And of course, the introduction of robotic surgery, which has really helped to increase pr surgical precision in the field of um, endometrial cancer. Other things that are important to predict, as specifically when we look at recurrence, is predicting which patients will recur and when will they recur. And that was the focus of the study um, that I've been working on. And so the question is, can we combine multiple clinical and pathologic factors together using machine learning algorithms to predict recurrence? So um, the study objective was to um, determine the best model to predict the dichotomous outcome of recurrence in high-grade endometrial cancer specifically using various machine learning algorithms. And the second objective was to determine the best model to predict time to recurrence in high-grade um, endometrial cancer. Um, ultimately, in the future, I would like to incorporate data on molecular classification um, to really make the models um, even better. But at the time, uh, we did not have this information with the databases that we've um, used. So as I mentioned, this is a pan-collaborative study um, across multiple centers in Canada using a database that has already been published um, in the literature um, from in two pre recent um, studies. So the data include was retrospective data collection from January 2012 to December 2016, and it included eight Canadian centers with um, 1,237 patients. And so to build the models, the data was divided arbitrarily using the uh, machine learning algorithm. 50% of the data was used to train the models, 25% was used to validate the models, and 25% were used to test the models. So we trained four models um, to predict the dichotomous outcome of recurrence, and this included random forest, boosted trees, and two neural networks. And we used ROC curves to determine the model performance, and the best model was selected based on the highest area under the curve in the test set. And then our second part of the study was to predict time to recurrence um, using survival models. And we trained a random forest and a lasso, which is the least absolute shrinkage model to compare and compared it to a Cox proportional hazards model. And the models were compared using a C statistic. Um, and so how we built um, the machine learning models to predict dichotomous outcome of recurrence. So first for the random forest model, we set parameters. These are the parameters that I set. I'm, I'm not gonna go into them in detail. And same thing for the boosted trees and the neural networks. Um, and each model was compared using receiver operating characteristic curve with the highest area under the curve in the test set. And we performed this analysis in JMP. The second, um, the second part of the study to predict time to recurrence or recurrence-free survival um, the, was done in R um, 
with the help of a data analyst and we use um, Cox proportional hazards. We use the least absolute shrinkage model, which is regression analysis that performs both variable selection and regularization to enhance the prediction accuracy. And we also use a random forest um, prediction model. So for our table one, and just to understand our patient population, um, there was a high proportion of, pa the highest proportion of stage patients were in stage one. Um, the median age of the total cohort was um, 67.2 uh, years old, um, and patients who had recurrence were slightly higher. Um, most of the preoperative histology was in the endometrioid and the serous subtype, um, and more, there were more patients in, in the recurrence group that had serous subtype. Um, that was on preoperative histology. And on postoperative histology, same thing, they were more commonly to be endometrioid and serous subtypes. In our population, um, about only 50% of the patients underwent a complete staging procedure, um, but this was um, in, the same, in the same range as the ones in the Portec 3 study, which was 54%. Um, see, uh, there were um, a small amount of patients. Most patients had negative um, cytology and the type of surgery, 39% of the total cohort had a laparoscopic um, procedure, 15% had robotic and 38.4% had a laparotomy. In terms of pathologic factors now, 46% of the population had um, positive LVSI with a higher proportion of patients um, in the um, recurrence group, and the median specimen weight was 120.9 um, grams um, in, the, um, in the total cohort. And the median specimen height um, was 8, the median specimen weight was 5.3, and the median specimen AP diameter was 4.5. In terms of myometrial involvement, um, there were more patients um, in the recurrence group that had over 50% myometrial involvement. The other thing that would be significant is that a, a high proportion of our patients um, underwent adjuvant treatment. Um, so 72.6% um, of our patients who had recurrence underwent adjuvant brachytherapy. And 51% um, of our patients that had recurrence underwent adjuvant radiotherapy. And 65% of them had um, adjuvant chemotherapy. And overall in our total cohort, the median follow-up time was 40.5 months. When we just look at simple uh, predictors of recurrence using a two by two table, um, we see that actually 12% of patients with stage 1A um, had recurrence, but again, the complete staging rate in these patients was only 50%. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And again, the overall uh, recurrence rate in our uh, population was 20.8%. Um, in addition, LVSI being grade three endometrial, um, having a cervical serostroma and having serosal involvement were all associated um, with recurrence. So when we look at the results of our bootstrap random forest model, um, these are this is the performance in the bootstrap random forest. And we can see that the top five predictors included post-operative stage, uterus height, specimen weight, receival of adjuvant chemo, and actually the preoperative diagnosis rather than the post-operative diagnosis. So the performance of the bootstrap random forest model was that it had an area under the curve of 85.2% in the training set, 74.2% um, in, the, in the validation set, and 72% in the uh, testing set. When we looked at our boost, uh, bootstrap, boosted tree, um, there was this, the top five uh, predictors were very similar, and um, the models performed similarly as well. The neural networks, however, didn't perform as well um, with 75% in the training um, set and 64% in the test set. And same thing when we used um, two hidden layers. So when we compared our models all together, putting them in, this, in the same um, ROC curve, um, we can see that the boosted, um, the uh, bootstrap random forest had the highest area under the curve, and this would, was our selected as our best model. So just to summarize again, our results among the four models tested, the bootstrap random forest had the best area under the curve in the test set, and was selected as the best model to predict recurrence in high-grade endometrial cancer. In terms of our, then we wanted to make a sub-analysis based on stage. Um, so we can see that the models didn't perform very well um, with an area under the curve of about 50 in both stage one and stage two patients. 
Um, however, when stage three and stage four, it had a high, much higher um, um, area under the curve. So 77% uh, and 80% in stage four. Um, and this could be one, either not that many patients um, in stage one and two um, in the subgroup analysis or, um, or two due to the fact that these were actually accurately um, staged patients. Um, then if we look at the boosted uh, tree sub-analysis by stage, we also see similar results in that it did not perform well in stage one and two, whereas in stage three and stage four, it did validate um, slightly higher with an area under the curve of 71% and in stage four, um, 76%. So the second part of our study was a machine learning and survival analysis with the primary outcome of recurrence-free survival. Um, so this is done in a different um, software. So the, the data is presented slightly differently, but it still uses a seed statistic, which is similar to the area under the curve um, to predict the model's um, performance. So we can see here um, that the Cox proportional hazards and the lasso uh, model performed similarly. However, the random forest model performed not not as well um, in the validation and in the test sets. Um, so we believe that in, in our data and the type of data that we're using, uh, perhaps machine learning to survival analysis models that we use um, would not be appropriate. And we can just use Cox proportional hazards um, in this situation. So next, we ran the same analysis subdivided by stage, um, and we found that the it was, it was even more confusing and even more blurry, as there were too many wide confidence intervals, likely too few events per subgroup, and did not come out to be a significant sub-analysis. So a discussion of our results is that in the bootstrap random forest models, despite adjusting for hyperparameters um, and running these models multiple times, the maximum C statistic in the set test set was always 71 to 72 percent. And the sub-analysis, however, when we looked by stage, um, the uh, the um, uh, the ROC um, in the area under the curves increased uh, up to 80 percent. And then when we did the survival analysis, um, we had a similar C index as compared to Cox proportional hazards. The other thing that we found was uterus height and weight was among the top five predictors of recurrence. And it was supported by um, our group's recent study that was recently published in Ganyang. Uh, we're looking at the predictors of recurrence um, in high-grade endometrial cancer using the same database. And they also found um, a higher um, hazard ratio um, in, when the uterus volume was over the 75th percentile and when the specimen weight was over the 75th percentile. So we do believe this is novel um, information in terms of predictor, predictors um, of uh, recurrence in high-grade endometrial cancer. Next is an advantage of using machine learning in endometrial cancer and is that it can really um, process many more predictors than logistic regression or Cox proportional hazards and it does not need to meet any assumptions, so for example, linearity or proportionality. Um, it can be useful for rare outcomes. So for example, our recurrence rate was 20%. So that's a relatively rare outcome where we wouldn't be limited by the number of predictors that we use into our models and we can use a very wide um, amount of variables. Um, and the other advantage is that we use the signal from the data to make predictions on, as compared to human programming, uh, which is subject to a lot of bias um, and human error. And it could run these algorithms much more efficiently. And there's great programs um, out there. And there's exceptional data scientists that can also collaborate with us as well. Some of the limitations of our study is that it was a multi-center retrospective data collection, which was is subject to the common um, biases of retrospective studies, and that not all of the patients were fully staged, possibly given the time frame of the study, possibly given the centers and the evolution of our, our understanding and introduction of sentinel lymph nodes um, in later times. And however, our staging rate, as mentioned, was consistent with data from the cortex studies. Um, so we did present this study as a poster at the IGCS and are currently in the um, uh, manuscript uh, 
publication phase and some of the comments that come back um, is on how we've used machine learning so far and just trying to understand and really gain a, a better grasp um, of how it's used. It's not specifically um, what I'm interested in here to complement our study is in endometrial cancer. Um, and so I've collaborated with a colleague um, from Harvard, again, under the supervision of supervision of Dr. Vikas, and we started to perform a systematic review on machine learning in endometrial cancer. And our objective was to evaluate the use of machine learning in endometrial cancer and identify the most common algorithms used and to describe the advantages compared to traditional statistics. So we reviewed papers in the English literature from 1985 to present, included full papers only, and included um, all of the machine learning algorithms that are available in the literature. And we've excluded non-English language patients, um, abstracts only, and non-relevant um, studies. So our, our Prisma diagram included initially our search um, in using the uh, library mesh words using uh, PubMed, Embase, and Medline. Um, the total identified 4,738 papers. Uh, we removed 443 duplicates. Uh, we've re reviewed 4,000 abstracts and excluded um, 3,634 um, uh, studies based on the abstracts alone. Um, so for example, if they didn't have our inclusion criteria, um, the full text articles um, reviewed um, were 661. And then the studies included in the systematic reviews ended up only being 30. So exclusions were um, either did not report on any machine learning algorithm, or in the study, they reported on machine learning, but for other um, cancers, but not necessarily endometrial cancer. If it was an abstract or a poster presentation, um, if the outcomes were not um, of interest to the outcomes that we wanted to look at in our study and editorial um, and editorial articles. So this is just a quick um, overview of um, some of the distribution of the patients that were included in these studies and their the mean age was 61.3 in the patients who had cancer, um, the distribution of the stages and the histological subtypes are mostly in uh, and whether and the type of surgeries that they had and the type of treatments. Um, so this is a small table, um, but it's really all of the studies that were included, um, the countries that um, that were in, involved, and what we were interested in, what exactly are the machine learning algorithms that are most commonly being used. So we can see here support vector uh, machine learning comes out quite often, lasso models, neural networks come out a lot. And so what we wanted to report is the sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of the best model um, reported in these studies. So here's the table that we found of the 30 studies. So of our primary outcome of interest, we can see that the neural networks were the most common um, machine learning algorithms used um, in, to study endometrial cancer. The second, uh, the second most common was support vector machine learning algorithms, and the third most common were random forest. Um, the others were decision trees, linear regression, Bayesian network, and radiomics was also, there was one study that included that. Um, and then Another interesting um, graph um, from our studies is that we were looking to see the overall sensitivity versus specificity, um, which was reported in 25 studies. And there was a 55% in the variation for the included studies showing the overall specificity could be explained by the sensitivity using the best models for each including studies. Um, and so it pretty much core, the sensitivity and specificity were pretty high. You can see that on the right side of the screen, I don't think you guys, I'm not sure if the audience can see my pointer or not, but on the right side of the graph, you really see that a lot of them tend to correlate. Whereas here at the bottom, we have three studies um, where there was the sensitivity and specificity were quite low. So in the future, if we, we can look further at these and possibly consider um, removing them um, from our study. And so as I, just to reiterate again is, um, it was important to look at the literature and see what is currently being done in machine learning and endometrial cancer and how to move forward um, and how to go about to just get better knowledge and, and, and uh, 
increase the knowledge and education in the Gainyang population and uh, Gainyang um, world as well. Um, and so the take home point is that we're really in the era of precision medicine right now. Um, and endometrial cancer, as well as many other of the cancers that we treat are no longer heterogeneous and there's many subtypes and molecular classifications. And that's where we're heading um, in terms of um, making more accurate predictions to better guide prognosis, better guide treatment and better guide follow up for our patients. The advantage of machine learning is that it can make prediction using high dimensional data and really efficient algorithms. And you know, there's been really a lot of hype in introducing machine learning and AI. And so there's always the question again, is will AI replace um, the physician um, or replace our role? Um, and I think that it really will complement us and complement the, the predictions that we're able to make. Um, but um, there have been a lot of challenges in terms of in, incorporating them, for example, into the EMR and incorporating them into decision making um, and uh, even a medical legal aspect is if you base your decision um, to, to treat or follow up or diagnose um, a certain thing using machine learning is that it, and you rely on that better than phys physician judgment will that lead to medical um, medical legal issues down the line in the future so uh, we as a global community of, of physicians and learners um, are really just starting to introduce machine learning and starting to learn the pitfalls and understand how it can be best use. So um, I really appreciate you all inviting me and listening to my talk today, um, because we can all together work towards um, improving the field um, and getting this well known um, in Gainyong. So I'm very grateful um, to our collaborators, to my supervisor, um, Dr. Vikas at um, Sunnybrook to allow me to have this pan-Canadian um, collaborative um, and Dr. Tomer Figenberg at, at Credit Valley, which is also the co-PI um, and all of the um, attendings and researchers in the Pan-Canadian Data Collection. So Dr. Walter Gottlieb, Marie Plant, Beatrice Carmier, Dr. Kwan, uh, who's on the call. I saw Susie Lau too on the call, um, Dr. May and Dr. Helpman um, for um, the data collection and for the, the database and already their expertise in the field with the published studies on this database. Um, Dr. Ling Zhang, the statistician on the original project. Dr. Um, Mr. Eric Drysdale from the Center of Computational Medicine and Anna Goldberg, um, from the uh, her lab at SickKids, and also um, my collaborators from Harvard um, for the performance of the systematic review. Um, so I really appreciate your feedback and any questions or comments at this time.